All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 130 today. Uh, we are joined by our guest, Dr. Gregory Little. Uh, Dr. Little is a psychologist, an author, uh, ancient mound researcher. We've had him on the show a, a couple times previously. Uh, you can check out his links down below. I have his website, freedomtochange.org. Uh, I have the link to his book, Dennis Sullivan Origins, which came out not that long ago. And uh, I believe he is working on a new book. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Andrew Collins and I are co-authoring a book again. Uh, this is actually going back sort of to our roots. Uh, I actually started out in UFOs. That was my initial interest in all of this. And from UFOs, I unexpectedly got interested in Native American mounds. That got me into all sorts of other things. Uh, my initial interest in UFOs really had to do with Carl Jung mm. uh, and Carl Jung's book, uh, 1959, called Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. Uh, so that uh, the new book is going into all of that. It is sort of Andrew's roots. Also, he started out in the UFO field uh, and then both of us got into ancient mysteries. And so we are trying to tie together many, many things. Uh, so yes, and I, I think we're going to talk about some UFO stuff this time and plasmas, things that go bump in the night and so on. Uh, <laughs> so fun. I'm ready. You guys are great, by the way. It's always a pleasure being on with you. Uh, I'm not sure how many shows that you do a month. Do you average like four a month or five a month? Uh, we try and do two a week, but lately I've been working on something. As I mentioned before, we're working on me and my buddy uh, and Maurice a little too uh, are working on getting something out there, a platform like um, it, it's going to be an app. Uh, it's going to be a place where people can talk about these kinds of things because more and more Excellent. on social media, you see things being taken down and stuff of that nature. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not going to be a place where people can just talk craziness. You know, hopefully there will be legitimacy and, and people can bring evidence based hypothesis, uh, hypotheses and theories and stuff like that forward and, and have interesting conversations about them. So, uh, but yeah, we try and do like two a week and, um, okay. So, Very good. but yeah, you're, you're interesting. You, you, you're pretty much our favorite guest at the, and, I, and it's not the, <laughs> it's not to single you out. We love all of our guests, obviously. I mean, we've had some fascinating conversations, but I think you're just so easy to talk to. Um, you, 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 have a you have a, a lot of knowledge on the subject and I like talking to people that are like big picture people that are kind of looking at all, gotcha. of, all the different facets and stuff like that. So well, I'm a, I'm a big picture person and, and thank you Maurice for my good connection. There it is. He, <laughs> they like my connection. Yeah. I'm floating yeah. it in the air here. Very good. <laughs> he, he is very crisp when we have him on, which we like. Well, yes, yes. there is, I had thought a lot about this cause I knew we were going to talk about UFOs and I know you've had on, um, Sean Cahill, is that yeah. his name? Yeah, we just yeah. yeah, great show. I watched that man. More people, thousands of people need to be listening to that. He's, He's a, a great really, dude. He's a really smart, he is. He's interesting guy. Got a great way of looking at this. Uh, got a great way of looking at the big picture and and, and not trying to explain it all. Mm -hmm. um, and so it made me think about how I used to talk about this. And actually, my first book came out in 1984. It was that follow-up to Carl Jung's book, and it was called The Archetype Experience. And in it, I mentioned that the UFO field is really, uh, in trying to find out what UFOs are all about, it's not just looking for a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. Because the haystack is made up of all sorts of things. You know, you had, back in the 50s, you had a lot of people that were hoaxing things. They Some contactees we know made stories up because they later admitted it. I'm not saying all the contactees did. Uh, but we know there were lots of hoaxes of people throwing things into the air and taking photos. We know today there's a We might have jinxed ourselves. Uh oh, might have jinxed you up. You're, you were cutting out there for just a second. Ah, uh, okay. Am I still cutting out? Uh, no, no. Back to good. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> the the whole idea in this is that it's not just looking for a needle in a haystack, but it's looking for a needle in a haystack of needles. Hmm. 
And that's really difficult to do. Imagine you have a haystack filled with needles and you want to find one particular needle thinking that needle is the key to the whole thing. But it's not. There are lots of different keys in there and it depends on what you want to look at and and uh, how you view the phenomenon as a whole. There are all kinds of factors at work. There's psychological stuff. There are some physical things going on. There's some electromagnetic things going on. And I guess that's where we're really going to go with this. Uh, I have never said that I don't that I believe nothing that we call UFOs uh, is extraterrestrial. I don't know if any of it is. I know that mm. the vast majority of it probably is not extraterrestrial. The vast majority of what we call UFOs are simply unknown lights, lights in the sky, lights that come to the ground, lights that people interact with and have strange experiences with. So there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, my, so it's possible that there are some uh, extraterrestrials. It's possible that there is such a thing as ancient aliens. Carl Sagan, I think I said this last time I was on, Carl Sagan wrote an article in, in 1961 that came out in the journal Space and Science, and Sagan cal calculated that aliens had either visited Earth or done so remotely, meaning they sent artificial intelligence craft with maybe robots guiding them uh, some 10,000 times was his calculations. Uh, and he, that was, again, 1961 that Sagan put that out. So yeah. it's all so that's like the possible. the von Neumann probe kind of idea that uh, yeah. self-replicating probes, like once you get to a certain level of technology, these, yep. yeah. Uh, so, exactly. It can replicate. Yeah. So, so when you say that, so you don't think anything, not like Roswell or any of nothing that's been here, you, in your opinion, has been extraterrestrial. Now, do you think that it's well, interdimensional, or like what do you think's going on? No, I didn't. I didn't. I don't think. I think Roswell's been explained. And when you start, when you say that Roswell's not extraterrestrial and a spacecraft that crashed, people hate you that believe in the ET hypothesis, but. I think that there may well have been some ET stuff, mm. but I don't think that's the bulk of what we're seeing today, and I don't think it relates to what we are calling abductions, uh, all of the mental phenomena that go on. Um, Andrew believes that there is an interdimensional component. He goes into quantum mechanics. He talks about uh, nonlinear causality. Um, but I don't think we have to invoke other dimensions to explain some of it. Uh, back, way back in the uh, 70s, actually, I started looking into plasmas and plasma technology. And I really didn't get heavily, because I was in graduate school at the time, I had too much other stuff I had to do. Uh, but when I was working on that book, The Archetype Experience, I became aware of government repository libraries. Uh, they are mainly in major research universities. They're a closed section of the library, uh, you, the, a locked section, and it's gigantic. The University of Memphis, which was then Memphis State University, is where I went to. And so I started going into there as a graduate student. I was allowed access. And I just wandered around and I was astonished. There were all these journals I'd never heard of, all these publications, governmental publications. And they were from the military. They were research studies sponsored by the U.S. government. And around, uh, we're moving now into the 80s. In the 1980s, I became aware that there was a massive, uh, massive governmental studies going on that were investigating plasma technology that had been derived from what they found about UFOs. Mm. I came to the conclusion that around the late 70s to early 80s, whatever sections of the government were real, the scientific sections that were studying UFOs came to the conclusion that they were, in fact, they used the term UAP, of course, and I know you've heard of that, mm -hmm. uh, but they were some sort of aerial phenomenon that were related to plasmas. 
Sometimes they could be picked up on radar. When people got too close to them because of their powerful electromagnetic fields that are like a bubble around these plasma formations, people would have very bizarre mental experiences, which could be seeing a UFO, feeling that they were abducted, being paralyzed, getting facial burns um, that, that were radiation burns. Um, they became aware that this was the core of the UFO phenomenon. Now, I'm talking about the government. So they started a lot of research to militarize it. You can actually see these quotes where they said, we can use this technology. So they started portioning out different areas of, of this research to laboratories all over the country. In an article, <laughs> I did this interview with um, Maurice Chevalier's um, grandson back in, it's actually 1995, in this magazine i hold up called paranoia mm. <laughs> this in uh, 1996 um with remy chevalier and just show you i don't know um uh, it was just an interview that we did and in it i said that i had uncovered 3,000 studies done by about a hundred scientists that were totally separated and those 3,000 studies were about studying some small area of this plasma technology and applying it to some sort of military application. So there's this huge series of military studies that have gone on involving plasma research, some of which everybody knows about. Almost everybody's heard of HARP, H-A-A-R-P. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We'll Maybe we'll talk about that in a moment. But most people don't know that there is a technology. The Navy actually patented this technology this year in 2020. Uh, they haven't put, I haven't found the name of it yet. But what it does, it is a plasma based uh, missile interrupter. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it, projects a plasma into the sky, anywhere into the sky. There can be multiple plasmas projected into the sky. We haven't explained even what a plasma is, but we'll get to that. Under some conditions, the plasmas can be picked up by radar. Most people don't think you can pick up energy, but plasmas technically, while they are energy, plasmas have a physical component to them. And I'll explain that in a minute. But these can be, they can, they can change their form and shape. They usually start rotating because of the magnetic field. They literally start a rotation. As a plasma rotates, it begins to flatten out. And often it takes the shape of what would look like a saucer, literally a, a double saucer stuck together. They can move. They can what look like fly. So they appear to be flying objects, and they move at impossible speeds. They make impossible right-angle turns. But it's because they're not flying in the, in the same sense as we think of an object that's flying. But they look like one. So 2020, this year, the U.S. Navy patented this technology. But it's based on a series of one, two. I've had to write these down because I can't remember them all. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different research projects done by the Navy that led to this. Now, four or five of the projects before this most recent one of putting out, it's almost like they are, they're not drones, but it's like they're false targets. And they're made to produce false targets for missiles or for jets that are flying. You can, the jets can see them in their targeting radar. They can see them in their infrared. Uh, but there's really nothing there but a ball of energy mm -hmm. and some dust. Long involved story. Uh, maybe we ought to explain what a plasma is. And I know this, it's going to tick off a lot of people, but I mean, this is actually in, this is public knowledge. There's nothing secret about it. It's just a matter of looking. Uh, the Navy actually made a weird one 
about uh, two years ago, 2018, and they have these strange acronyms for every one. They have one called Pickle, a Pep, a Pass, a Lipe, and a Scupples. I like that. And another one called Impress. The Scupples was done last year, S-C-U-P-L-S, and it stands for Scalable Compact Ultra Short Pulse Laser System. And it's something that can be put into a Hummer, small like a Hummer, and they can drive this thing around and it can create these plasmas anywhere within a mile or so and create a flash bang, multiple lights that can actually burn people's skin. Uh, These are things made for crowd control and also for battlefield technology. Uh, Some of these some of these will actually put words in your head. Now, I know you're familiar with Michael Persinger. He was a, right? You guys have heard of Persinger. I actually, I haven't. Okay. Michael Persinger is a neuropsychologist who Mm -hmm. was in Canada at Laurentian University. When I say this, you'll remember, he produced a device called the God Machine. Mm, Uh, It's been on lots of TV shows, uh, and it was a helmet you put over your head. He actually took a football helmet And then it had a lot of electrodes. You would go into a uh, copper shielded room that was acoustically soundproof. And then by focusing uh, various electromagnetic fields or essentially a small plasma in different areas of the brain, you could have strange experiences. And in one of them, depending on the frequencies, people would claim they would meet God or an angel. That's why it was uh, called the God machine. Well, plasma... uh, Persinger started this research in the 70s. He was one of the people that was doing a lot of the military research, uh, again, at Laurentian University in Canada. He died uh, two years ago. Uh, by the way, Persinger went to Canada to escape the draft. Uh, he was from Tennessee, went to the University of Tennessee, and uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, a lot of Americans who didn't want to go to war went to Canada. So anyway... Persinger developed a uh, frequency where electromagnetic frequency where he could beam words into your head. The military actually has this now. Uh, It is uh, fully operational. You can actually get on, um, you can go to Popular Mechanics and you can see some video of how this thing works. Uh, It works approximately a distance of one mile right now. The one that they've operationalized so imagine there's this hummer driving around and on the top there is this what looks like an antenna and it can point a certain area and somebody a mile away it can appear in front of them like a ball of light and speak to them Mm. wow i mean it it sounds amazing or people will hear it in their head they can actually beam it into their head persinger was doing this uh it was in the mid 80s that he developed this go ahead you had a question no okay so i was just gonna say so 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 far, it's to me, it sounds like what you're saying is this we acknowledged or found out that this plasma technology was a natural phenomena, and then you're saying that we tried to harness it and now are using it to some sort well, of well, we have harnessed it, okay, we have harnessed some of it. it it's uh, it's easy to create. I don't believe that uh, there was actually a guy named Albert Budd, and this is all in this. All this stuff isn't in the book yet. I'm not sure we're going to put any of this military stuff in the book, but I am going to put in what I'm about to tell you. Uh, Back in 1994, I corresponded with a British guy named Albert Budden. Mm -hmm. Budden uh, was talking about electromagnetic pollution that was appearing everywhere in the world, and he believed that it was causing an increase in uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder and stress disorders, anxiety, um, ADHD is another example. He believed that the great increase we're seeing in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder was caused by all the electromagnetic pollution. Um, and that all of that is in the book. Now, I was working on the same ideas that Budden had. Budden believed that all UFO phenomenon was electrical and electromagnetic in nature. It had no intelligence whatsoever. It was generated from natural earth energy. And with the increase in human produced electromagnetic energy, that it was causing all these other mental aberrations. Uh, And that is one place where we 
uh, differed dramatically. There is evidence that what we call naturally produced plasmas, uh, they appear to have intelligence. Lots of evidence to that. Even physicists have said that these appear to have intelligence. Uh, the chairman of the of the physics department at Southeastern Missouri State University wrote a book in 87, and he said point blank that these plasmas that they were studying as UFOs at that time had intelligence. He didn't know how to explain it, but he said these are they're probably a form of life that we don't understand. So I'm not saying that it's that it is totally unintelligent, that it doesn't have a form and a nature of its own. What I'm saying is when the military discovered that the plasmas were the underlying root of uh, some of the strangest UFO experiences and particularly the unexplained light formations, somewhere somebody got the idea of. Uh, We can use this technology if we can figure it out. So they started to figure it out. Uh, Even in the in the 80s, another one, Empress, E-M-P-R-E-S-S. These weird these weird acronyms they have: electromagnetic pulse radiation, environmental stimulation for ships. That's Empress. What they were doing were put these these plasma based technology on barges sent them into the Atlantic Ocean and also into the Gulf of Mexico, 25 miles offshore. This was in the 80s they were doing this. And they were pulsing radiation to see what the effects were on ships and what people would report. A lot of this is just simple experimentation to see, I wonder what if. I think I've told you at some point, maybe in a maybe it was in an email or something, or maybe it was on a message in Twitter, that I worked for about a year and a half with the Office of Naval Research in the 70s. It was 1972 to 74 that I worked for them on a project. We traveled all over to uh, naval air stations all over the place and tested pilots going into a um, – copper shielded acoustically sealed room and we put all we navy pilots that were helicopter pilots and prop pilots and jet pilots we were testing we carried this bizarre equipment with us and i really didn't even know what the study was Hmm. Uh, but i got to go to the office of naval research one time uh and i knew the uh this guy who was the the head of the research project i was doing knew pretty well um they did a lot of what, what we used to call I wonder what if experiments. And what that means is it's like you say, well, I wonder what will happen if we beam a um, – let's say that we beam a plasma into the air over Eglin Air Force Base for 10 nights in a row. I wonder what will happen. And so they, they do these kind of experiments. That's literally what it is. I wonder what if. What will happen if we inject this animal with this drug? That's what basic pharmacology starts with. So Mm -hmm. there was a lot of that experimentation going on in the 70s and the 80s through the Office of Naval Research, and they're the ones who've done almost all this plasma research. Uh, I believe that in the 80s, the reason I use that example um, about, I wonder if we beam a plasma into the air for 10 straight nights over Eglin Air Force Base, I believe they actually did that. Uh, and I wrote about that in 1994 uh, in a book called Grand Illusions. My wife and I actually saw the 10th night, got a picture of it. Uh, there were 104 people in Gulf Breeze uh, at the time, uh, including Ed Wal- Walters, who had written books about the Gulf Breeze UFOs. Uh, and it was directly over Eglin Air Force Base. The night before we were there, uh, there was a Japanese film crew there filming a documentary Uh, And actually counted the people and put that number in a book, 104 people in there. And they knew exactly what time the light was going to show. It was white to begin with, then it became red. It lasted almost exactly one minute. They even knew when it was going to turn out because it did the same thing 10 nights in a row. Mm. Uh, And it was just obvious to me, Eglin is very close to where ONR is, Office of Naval Research. And it was obvious to me that that's exactly what's going on. It was a I wonder what if experiment. And they were trying to see how what people would how they would react, what would be in the news. Uh, I suspect I actually looked around in the crowd because I suspected that there were some plants there from the Office of Naval Research trying to get some information 
or to find out behaviorally how people were reacting. Uh, so, okay, so what's a plasma? Maybe I need to say that. A plasma, yeah. it's the fourth state of matter. Right. Everybody knows you have liquid and solid and gas. So the fourth state of matter is one that almost nobody learned when they were in school. If you're older, you just never heard about it. They just didn't talk about it because plasma physics weren't really much wasn't known when I was in school or even in graduate school. There wasn't much known. A plasma is essentially a superheated ball of gas, but it's not gas entirely. Uh, when it superheats or ionizes it becomes electrostatic and electromagnetic. So there's an electrostatic uh, attraction in it. And so it begins pulling into it any dust or material that happens to be into, in the air at the time. And it becomes a charged ball that, again, it's superheated. That's why it's called ionized. So it's ionized air and the particles in the air. It, it looks like it's a ball of light it depending on the frequency of the electromagnetic field it can change colors depending on the strength that has it can get large if it has too much strength it dissipates into a big burst of light it just pops uh, and that actually is what happened uh with uh, what they call bubba Bubba was the name of the light and Gulf Breeze. They actually had a nickname for it. You can look it up on the internet, Bubba and Gulf Breeze, and you'll see reports about this uh, 10-day event that occurred down there. Uh, so plasmas can be formed with laser technology. It took some time for them to figure this out, but it's a pulsed laser because if you put too much energy into it, it will explode. And when I say explode, it's not like dynamite exploding. It's a big dissipation. Mm. It's a pop where the whole thing dissipates. Uh, or it can be sustained with these pulses by putting a certain amount of energy into it. It can be moved from place to place by simply pulsing the energy and moving the laser you can make the laser invisible by changing the frequency. The reason that laser that most people think a laser is a visible beam of light, that's not always the case. It depends what the frequency is that the laser is on. That's what it boils down to. So there's energy involved. How much energy is the laser going to put into it? What the frequency is? Is it pulsed or is it a steady beam? And how do you move it? And then... Whether or not it's picked up on radar depends upon how much the electrostatic magnetism is to pull in dust particles into it, or even water for that matter, it could pull into it and super superheat water molecules. So then it would be picked up on radar. So that's a plasma. Plasmas occur, earth lights are believed to be plasmas naturally occurring from tectonic strain. Uh, there's such a thing as uh, volcanic earth lights. They occur with volcanoes. Yeah, I was going to mention uh, that. We're the piezoelectric effect. Yeah, yeah. the uh, well, no, I we're, I'm been, I put together a super volcano like slideshow episode that we do when we don't have guests. Like we do these slideshow episodes, uh, and I've been doing a lot of research into like super volcanoes and like Yellowstone and then like the Ring of Fire and that kind of stuff. Um, and there are lights um, that are produced. Um, but I don't. I wouldn't say that they're very UFO like. Because I was watching some movies. I was looking at no, pictures. They don't really look like. So I was trying to like. Okay, could this be possibly an explanation for some of you know? I'm sure um, that explains when people see those lights. Like, oh, maybe they thought it was something weirder than it actually was, like earthquake lights yeah. or you know something like that. You know, but um, but it's interesting because uh, what you're talking about. I mean, there's what is it? The electric universe theory. Um, and then you have like Dr. Anthony Parrott, who I'm sure you, you know, he did the work yeah. with, uh, Dr. Robert Schock and trying to explain the animal headed gods of ancient Egypt and all the petroglyphs around the world. Right. Um, so it is interesting that this, if, you know, if what you're saying is true, like this phenomena could be the catalyst for like so many things, um, that have to do yeah. with this one subject. But I, so then the, the question becomes, 
does that mean that there's something greater going on with the phenomena? Like you mentioned, how you differed in opinion. You think that maybe there's something, some sort of intelligence or um, uh, maybe, well, you know, something like that behind it. Yeah. That, okay, so uh, this phenomenon with plasmas has been researched thoroughly, scientifically researched in two places. One of those is in Missouri by the uh, Harley Rutledge and his research group uh, at Southeastern Missouri State University back in the 70s. Uh, in the 80s, there was another large group that did research on the Yakima Indian Reservation, uh, which is in Washington State. Um, okay, so in the 80s, I'm going to talk about Yakima for a minute. Starting in the 1960s, uh, on this, it's a gigantic reservation. Uh, it has a lot of woods on it and a lot of trees. So there are all these fire outlooks on the tops of mountains, a whole bunch of them. They're manned by Native Americans. So they started reporting seeing these orange balls of light. And these orange balls of light would move around. They would drive out to try and see them, thinking they were fires. They weren't. Loads of reports. There's hundreds of these reports. The orange balls of lights, lights then began to become uh, orange and white, seen by more and more people. There is one particular ridge there where I've spent several nights, uh, actually, with officials uh, with the Washington state government. Long involved story because I went there after the Yakima tribe closed off access to UFO researchers. They didn't want anybody else coming in. Uh, so I had to get special permission from Washington state. And then those officials were so interested in the phenomenon. They went out with me to, to sit there and watch for UFOs at night. We never saw any, another story, but anyway, um, they set up all of these uh, scientists came in. This was in the 70s with permission of the Yakima Reservation. They came in and they set up all these triangulations and they found that most of the lights were coming from a, a, the same area. It is a long ridge called Topanish, T-O-P-P-E-N-I-S-H. It has over 100 earthquake fault lines on it. And they would actually film some of these lights coming out of these fault lines. They're very visible on this ridge. And they'd watch them kind of tumbling down the sides. Now, that's not as interesting as what I'm about to tell you. There are Native Americans that live at the base of this ridge. And there are, there's all these stories where people that lived there started making reports these are all in newspaper reports, a lot of magazines, they're in books. Uh, some of the scientists that were there wrote books about it. Uh, what the Native Americans reported was this. They would see these lights coming down and then they would form sometimes into what looks like a saucer sitting on the ground or an object. They would report seeing beings, large beings, walking out of these objects. Sometimes uh, children reported seeing three or four humanoid forms walking out of them and walking along the road. Others saw what appeared to be Bigfoot walking out of them. So oh. it's, it's, it's not as simple as just seeing a light. Now, these people were getting very close to these objects. So there was some sort of interaction. Uh, going back to Michael Persinger, the guy I had mentioned in Canada, Persinger did a lot of research showing that there are brain areas directly affected by these elect the electromagnetic fields around plasmas, and they produce strange out-of-the-body experiences with an interaction of beings there are a multitude of types, everything from traditional grays to the little people of Native American lore uh, to fairies, goblins, and even like Bigfoot. Uh, so my belief is, is that there is a sentence, uh, I'm not even sure I can pronounce that correctly, that it has an intelligence and a, and a consciousness of its own. Some of that comes from, some of my belief comes from Native American lore about these beings and the lights. Um, but any, anyway, that, that's just kind of a summary. I do believe that these are not just simple lights that are naturally produced. 
Um, by the way, so calm down, folks. Size... He does believe. Yeah, he does believe. I'll, I will. But <laughs> we're just trying to get to the truth of the matter here. Let's let's exhaust all options before we okay. talk extraterrestrial. Correct. I mean, that would be if you're looking at it from like an objective, scientific. And I I believe too. I believe that there's weirdness. I believe there's more to life. But you have to look at all these different things to kind of pick apart. And you know, if we're gonna ever get yes. some sort of technology or scientific um, explanation or proof, we have to start looking at it as such. And, and um, you know, real scientists aren't going to really do this work because they're being needed to do other things and objective things within Weapons. certain fields and exactly well, whatever the case may be. But they're just they're they're more interested in other things, or maybe it's too taboo still, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but to look at these things objectively, I think that's that's the way to look at it. If you're really looking for truth, obviously anybody can believe anything. You can watch a documentary or a TV show and be convinced of anything. But even um, I was going to mention this too. While we were talking about the lights and the earthquakes and the uh, seismic activity and stuff, um, did you have you seen Project Blue Book that was on History Channel? Yeah, yeah I thought I it was did. good. I thought it kind of did the whole phenomenon justice by showing that. As close as you get, there's still something that's holding you back, and it's always this like this little bit of a, um, uh, you know, we're gonna get the truth. Oh wait, then there's this other piece that comes back and kind of debunks that, but then there's something else kind of pulling you, you know, further along. So, uh, but there's an episode on Skinwalker Ranch, and I know that there's the show right now on. Um, uh, History Channel, History. and yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of people talking about it and stuff. Um, on Pro Project Blue Book, they explained it as they were pumping gas or like the same kind of gas that gets emitted through earthquakes and seismic activity, and that's what's causing the hallucinations. And there's actually precedent mm -hmm. with, with that, with the sure. um, the the aura of coal of Delphi and, and you know the Greeks. Yeah, and they used oh, to in inhale you know the uh, yeah. not, the gases from the earth and then you know hallucinate and go into an altered state. So. Something like that, I feel like that's a good explanation for that because that area is very seismically active and it's right near Yellowstone or actually not that far. And right. most people right. don't even realize how big Yellowstone's, um, you know, that the super cauldron. volcano. Yeah, the cauldron. Well, there's a few of them. People, you know, well, again, we're going to do an episode on it. But yeah, that whole area is very seismically active. There's a lot of weird stuff that goes on, I'm sure, from natural phenomena. But. I, what did you? What do you think about that? As far as do you think that there is truly paranormal things going on, or do you think that those yes. could be naturally explained? No, I think it's all paranormal. I'm 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 using what appears to be natural as part of the paranormal. It's all the same. Native Americans talked about it as part of the whole spiritual universe and the spiritual world, and it all has its own intelligence, its own consciousness, and I I really believe that. I think that it all has its own sentence and hmm. uh, what it because there uh, there are natural phenomenon involved we assume that it's all that it that it has no intelligence of its own uh, and that's an assumption that a lot of people may I mean I'm talking about plasmas like and and this like oh that explains it doesn't there, it goes way deeper than that. All I'm making the point here is that the military has weaponized and uh, something that they found by studying UFOs. And I find that very interesting. And I find it weird enough that I'm not going to probably put any of that in this book because it becomes a sideline to people. And when I say a sideline, it's like they get trapped on it and you start going down that path. Uh, another good example, years ago, this guy named Augie Roberts, who was one of the first UFO guys ever around, he put out these picture books of early UFOs from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, which he, he collected so many pictures. Roberts wrote a book review, and he said in it that, imagine this giant puzzle that covers an enormous area of miles and miles and there's pieces everywhere and as you walk around it you'll see a person putting a piece on and they get so focused into that area they never see that it's a gigantic puzzle mm. that's the ufo field you can get into one area and so focused on that area and you go eureka i've got it i've solved the puzzle no you haven't you're in one little tiny part of it and mm -hmm. it's an illusion that you've solved it you're in that one little piece but it's gigantic so i'm talking with the plasma stuff i'm talking about one little piece of it 
that's why I say, well, uh, you know, maybe there are ancient aliens. Maybe there were, maybe there are some UFOs visiting here. Yes, I believe plasmas are involved, but I believe plasmas have an intelligence and there's an interaction, electromagnetic interaction with human and human consciousness and the human mind. These other beings probably do exist in their own realm. Native Americans told us there was, that they did, that these are very real creatures. Religion tells us there's they're very real que- creatures, and I think angels and what you might call demons and fairies and goblins and the little people, I think they all have some basis in reality. Hmm. But they're all one piece of this gigantic puzzle that's just enormous. Uh, so we can get fooled and just stuck in one area. So I try not to get stuck in an area. But when I go off in a rant like I did it a minute ago, <laughs> uh, it can sound like I'm stuck in that area, but I'm not. I No, am look, home. I think it's important to put information out there. Now, you look, I think you will even admit you could be wrong, too. Maybe these aren't plasmas, Absolutely. but— it's it's important to put that information out there so that th- this is actually discussed. And I mean, look, the Pentagon acknowledged that those three videos were real, yeah, right? We're just gonna bring this up. And, yeah, oh yeah. And, and they didn't they didn't give an explanation. So I would assume that if we knew that was just our basic plasma holograms that we're projecting out there, like you said, that's been written about, it's been put out there. Well, that just came out recently that because they just patented it this year. Well, but what I'm saying is, is why wouldn't they then say that that's you know. I, w- I would think that they I w- well okay so this is where it gets tricky here we like, go folks then you're, then you're counting on the narrative of something that may or may not be true or what who knows what they know or whatever um well that's what they want i mean if you're the military you don't want the other side to know what you have and you want them to speculate that you've got more than what you really have wasn't mm-hmm. yeah but the ultimate speculation is we we're, we're friends with ufos right i mean isn't that the ultimate well, um, no maybe there's some there's later we can talk about some other things, but I won't do it on I won't do it okay, well, okay. here. Yeah. It's not any big seeker or anything. It's just there's some stuff that off topic. But no, I think the the military wants you to think they uh, I think they have the technology to create these false ghost images. And when I call them a ghost, it's because they move around. They can appear to be physical. Right. They're not physical in the sense that they're a craft. Uh, and but they're I mean, that's picked up by radars. Yes, and picked up by radar because plasmas can can be physical. What about uh, visual by, and, again, in daylight too? So then you have like Commander Fravor um, and the pilots' accounts and all that. So yep. Well, they can reflect sunlight. They they produce because they create an electromagnetic shell around them, hmm. uh, and they can change by changing the frequency. I mean, it's like light. Colors of light are just different frequencies in the visible light spectrum, which is a tiny little portion of the electromagnetic energy spectrum. Right. Four percent of the electromagnetic energy spectrum is visible light and visible light is broken down into all the colors of the rainbow and each one of them slightly different. So UFOs can go through this a big color change and they can change many, many colors over a few moments in time. And that's just simply an alteration in their frequency. Hmm. I mean, it sounds crazy in a way, right. but it's, it, so, it's, I don't think it is. So from your standpoint, it sounds like this is, this whole thing, like you said, is just piece of this big paranormal puzzle, puzzle. Um, almost like a Jacques Vallée passport to Magonia or something along those lines. I'm actually reading, rereading John Keel's Eighth Tower right now, and there's some stuff about I, this kind of stuff in there. Yes, there is. I, Keel is in the, I'll, I'll say this, John Keel is the first I ever saw to speculate that we are like an antenna, like a radio antenna. Mm -hmm. We are walking around through an electromagnetic world, and as we walk around, we absorb these electromagnetic signals. And this paranormal, whatever it is, the ultra-terrestrials, or what he calls them in that book you're reading, that they are broadcasting, and we are like radios picking up the signals. Our brain is the antenna, and we are picking up the signals within the brain. We know we have magnetite. We know the pineal gland probably responds to it. Um, Keel called it, called that intelligence ultra terrestrial because it was tied to the world, but it's beyond our comprehension. 
and that it does things that make no sense to us because it has a completely different kind of logic. Mm. We don't understand it. And that's even Native Americans said the same thing. They said that that there's a primordial consciousness to the spiritual world that defies our comprehension. We cannot understand what the primordial consciousness of it is. We try to, but we all use our own belief system to do that. I will say this about Valley. Um, I spent hours with Jacques Valley not many years ago. I think it was 2009. Um, and he looked at me and said point blank, UFO, in his nice French accent, UFOs have absolutely nothing to do with plasmas. Um, now that was back then. I don't know if he's changed his mind or not because I haven't talked to him since then. Uh, but plasma was a dirty word in ufology, uh, because Philip class, who was the ultimate UFO skeptic came up with the plasma theory and said, oh, they're just plasmas and plasmas have no intelligence whatsoever. And people see the light and that's that. Uh, and that's that is uh, what Valley tied the plasmas into. But I think we've come a long way since then. And there's all this research in psychology and neuroscience that pretty much shows that plasmas do affect our consciousness. So I don't know. I don't know if I want to keep going on with plasmas here or not, because it's just one little puzzle, one yeah. piece of this gigantic puzzle. Yeah, it's we, a huge puzzle. We can move on. Um, but, yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, like you said, we had um, – Sean Cahill on and I have no doubt that what he saw was 100% real um, yes. and as all the people involved in, in those incidents and then the three videos and stuff so um, with that being said I guess that's an option of what it could have been but I mean I still think even I don't know I just based on what, what they their accounts and everything I, I would have to see one of these plasmas in action to kind of get a feel maybe that'll never happen but i think if uh, no you can see that get online go online well, i, I up, have looked at yeah. similar things like i said like you know ball lightning and uh the the volcano and earthquake lights and, and all the yeah. different um natural light formations that can occur and uh I, I look is it possible yeah i think that that's possible and there's a lot of people that believe in the electric universe theory and that whole yeah. concept and um so yeah, I mean it it would be interesting to to look further into that which I'm probably going to do, but uh so let's talk about a little bit more of like the psychology side of this now. So um you know, we were just mentioned you were mentioning like all these different things and you've got uh passport to Magonia where on the cover it's it's an alien holding up all these different masks, right? Um yeah. Do you think that that's a possibility that there is this like one entity energy whether it's extraterrestrial ultra terrestrial whatever it is that's manifesting itself to whatever we're open to so if i'm studying ufos right now maybe this entity would come to me as uh an alien or if i'm studying religion maybe it comes to me as an angel or a demon or god or whatever so uh do you think that there's something to that and do you think it's our our connection to that thing or do you think it's that thing being like almost like a trickster you know like a thoth type uh... well yeah i actually that this new book uh we've reversed i'm writing the beginning of it andrew's doing the second part i really start out talking about tricksters um and the whole trickster phenomenon and it goes into the the Native American and shamanistic beliefs about creation and so on. But a lot of Carl Jung is in it and it because it fits and a lot of John Keel. Jung, Keel and the Native Americans all said the same thing using slightly different ter terminology. So in, in terms of uh, I don't think there's one force per se. If I like the Native American idea, the ancient idea that everything started out as a singularity. That's actually a word that was used by the one of the Cheyenne, the, the, I want to call him an arrow priest, but he wasn't just the arrow priest. He was a blue, blue sky, blue sky shaman, medicine, the head medicine man, the high priest of the Cheyenne for the Massam ceremony. And when he explained it, uh, the Massam ceremony is about creation. Hmm. And, and connecting to creation. And it started out with a singularity, and the singularity split. And when it split, 
at the moment of creation, it created two great forces. And within the two great forces, they split and it created a whole bunch of other entities, almost like your body is made up of about 50 trillion living cells. Mm -hmm. They all have their own life cycle. Uh, do they have some form of consciousness? Uh, not that we know of, but on the other hand, they all have their own life processes. Every single one of them does the same kind of thing. They all are alive in and of themselves. So at I've the heard time, that theory in con connection with um, like DMT use and like heavy psychedelics oh, yeah. is that when you're in com communication with these entities, it's actually might be the, like the microscopic... Uh, you know, cells or organisms in, in, yeah, within you. So uh, I've, hey, it's an interesting I, I theory. I can't, I don't know. At the all split, the Jung called them archetypes and he talked about they're in opposites. They're all over. They're opposing opposites. Um, Native Americans talked about them as opposites. It was a trick to help. Uh, there are little people, there's giants, there's all kinds. There's an upper world, a lower world. Uh, and there's all of these different creatures. Each one of them has like an opposite somewhere in nature. And they all are different forces. There's different powers in nature. Um, Jacques Vallée talked about how this thing adapts culturally to us, depending on our belief system at the time. So in the 1800s, people were seeing airships. Instead of modern UFOs like we see, they were, they were seeing airships. That was one of the examples that Valley used, that it was adapting culturally to what people thought the future was going to look like. Do you think, Today, though, that that's based on our – do you think that that's just how they could explain it, though? For instance, um, if somebody, an indigenous person, never saw a boat approaching shore, how would they explain it? You know, It would be a floating right. island or something along those lines. Exactly. They wouldn't have any yeah. context. So do you think that that psychologically – the airship thing is specifically just because they didn't have um, the modern perception of what we have with, in terms of like a UFO and maybe Absolutely. better footage of it kind of a thing. It's a cultural adaptation to whatever the culture is at the time. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Native Americans lived in a mystical paranormal world where every animal and every tree, every insect, every fish, every water stone, everything was part of the paranormal world. It's not animism, like they've been derided as believing, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the belief that everything has an ultimate spiritual nature. It is made from the same primordial spiritual energy, and it's all connected somehow. It's almost like panpsychism uh, in a way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Pan, the, the mm -hmm. ultimate Earth Gaia, Earth energy, Mother Earth, all of that, it all fits. Uh, but that pan wouldn't just be the earth. It probably exists everywhere in the universe. Mm. So it's it's everywhere. And Native American, the Native American belief system would be that it's everywhere in the universe. It just happens we live here, and this is what we're interested in the most mm. uh, because we're here. It's what we are interacting with. So all this is just – it's like little pieces of that gigantic puzzle out there. So I don't think – I'd like to have a theory of everything. Mm. Um, you know, I'd like to. But I don't. I have a theory of some things. Uh, I do believe that the Tic Tacs, at least right now, I believe that the Tic Tacs that were viewed were an experiment done by to see how the uh, pilots would react and respond. I believe it was an experiment done to see how the people on the uh, Nimitz and the other ships would respond. The same thing also went on near Jacksonville, and the same thing has gone on in Virginia Beach. The pilots in Virginia Beach have talked about it. Some of the pilots in Jacksonville, Florida, have talked about it. The same thing has occurred there. Uh, I don't. I think the only place where they've released some more pictures or bits of information comes from Jacksonville, but I think that's ongoing experimentation by. I'll call it the Office of, of Naval Research for just lack of information of who else it might be. But it's probably ONR doing it uh, to see how pilots respond. And that is why you've heard virtually nothing. That is why the Navy's not responding. That's why they didn't shoot. You know, that's why they weren't told to try and shoot it down. 
that's why the other ships didn't try to fire missiles at it and get rid of it because it shouldn't be there. Uh, I think they were told to stand down. Mm. And I think it's just the kind of thing that they do to see how people are going to react. It is a I wonder what will happen if experiment. What will happen if if they suddenly see this thing out there where it shouldn't be? What will the pilots do? How they how will they respond? That is what I believe. So then what but about, that's just one piece. Yeah. But what about then like so people have obviously weird things. Pilots have seen weird things even before. Oh, yes. I'm sure this technology was even being tested. So like what about like absolutely foo, yeah, the foo, foo fighters, yeah, foo and fighters. Yep. And, yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm not I'm talking not... about Dave Grohl here. <laughs> <laughs> uh the, if you look at the British MOD's report called Project Condine, uh, which came out, I think, in 2006. I wrote it down. Uh, two, nine, it was 97 to 2000 is when they did it. Uh, their report, I think, came out in 2004. Uh, Project Condine actually studied those, the Foo Fighters. Uh, my father was a pilot in World War II. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, he's in a senior center, by the way, locked down because of COVID-19. Uh, another story. But um, in Project Condine, they say point blank that they were plasmas and they were attracted to the um, external sort, the external covering of the planes at the time. And Project Condine says point blank that they can be considered dangerous uh, planes were able to often outfly them. To, uh, modern aircraft can outfly these, and they say do not fly through them. That's actually in Project Condine, which you can download that report. I think it's uh, 700 pages long, mm. uh, and I read it when it first came out and wrote a couple of articles about it because I found it interesting, but it was virtually ignored in the UFO report because it didn't say that any UFOs were alien craft that they were flying saucers. It said that they were plasmas. Uh, but it's a fascinating report. And I, even when I read it, I said, my God, they could have taken that straight out of my book, People of the Web, which is out of print, so I'm not trying to sell it. Uh, and they could have taken it out of the book, um, Grand Illusions, which is out of print, and a whole bunch of articles that I wrote. It's all it's the same stuff I was writing about then. So there were loads of us looking at the same thing then, coming to the same conclusion. But that's something you ought to look up. Project Condine, it's spelled C-O-N-D-I-G-N. That's for your listeners. Okay. Fascinating, fascinating report. Just says they're plasmas, point blank. So is it possible, too, that maybe we were working on this stuff and that maybe, you know, we knew we know about all this, but maybe we haven't dialed it in in the sense like maybe um, – Maybe what was seen was real, but we are still doing like I'm, I'm just trying to to gauge here like what um, I guess I, I understand what you're saying about the plasmas and like the reasoning behind yeah. it and all that stuff. But I'm right. just trying to understand. So there's been weird stuff seen forever. Um, so the plasma thing, is it possible that what you're saying is true, that maybe we ha have been working on that, but then also that maybe those Tic Tacs were a natural or um interdimensional version or whatever the case may be paranormal version of those things or like maybe that's Any, where we got the idea well i think we got the idea from the from like project condine and all the ones before it i mean i haven't there's this all these pl phased plasma burst machines and it uh all of this is well known I, i'm looking at a list of about 12 different navy projects on using plasmas and i think they got all that from the early ufos as far as what's possible yes anything is possible hmm. uh i think the um I, just, I, I hate to say it uh, because it, I'm not trying to burst a bubble. I think this is a fascinating field. UFOs are real. UFOs exist. Uh, I think our government has taken advantage of that and found out that there is a reality to them based on plasmas. They have weaponized that. I think they have tested it out repeatedly. I think they are currently testing it out uh, on water where it's safer as opposed to land. Uh, they're testing it out on active current pilots uh, and active current personnel to see what the responses are. There are some people probably on board the ships who are aware of it, who stop them from overreacting like firing missiles. 
uh, at it to take it down. But I think it, they are simply testing what how these people react. Yeah, and but what about like it. Colonel Fravor, like all these people that or were, were interacting with these things that uh, so obviously they have their orders should be engaged, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah. So you're saying, but some of those people at the top are speaking out too, saying they don't know, you know, footage is being taken and all these mm-hmm. different things. Um, yep. So I, most wouldn't know. Yeah. Most wouldn't know. Oh. It's, you know, oh, that God. most of them wouldn't know about it. And like I said, I, I was astonished at this. I wonder what if experiments the in the office of naval research. When I was there, I went one time I talked to two employees and there was an army colonel who was in charge of the project that I did, that I was working with. There were two of us, two assistants in it, and we're the ones that actually traveled to all the bases and, and did the work on it. But I was astonished uh, with the two other employees that I got to talk with about all this stuff they did just for the heck of it, just to see what was going to happen. It was like a research lab that was, they said, do whatever you want to do, but find us something interesting. So they just did so much. I wonder what if experimentation, you know, what's going to happen if we do this? What will happen if we do that? And a lot of their research was on behavioral responses. That was loads of it. Uh, Everything from acoustics, you can vibrate with with electrostatic fields. You can vibrate things in the environment and create words Hmm. they have there is one of these devices see which one it's called interesting uh where they create a ball of plasma that looks it could look like a burning bush if they wanted it to and it speaks it's the one that is beamed out over a mile this is a technology you can see that on a youtube video actually got that to where this ball of plasma forms and then you can hear it. Mm. it. It will speak whatever words they program into it to speak. And when I say program, I mean that's done by changing the frequency. And it, air is, sound is vibration in the air. When you change the frequency of the plasmas, you know, they spark, they, they make noise, they crackle, they sound like they're burning sometimes depending on their temperature and whatever frequency they're at. But you can vibrate the air with them, too. And that's how they make them speak. <laughs> no, it's bizarre. No, it's I absolutely bizarre. I believe it. I would like but to see some... all this technology is out there. Yeah. I would like to see testing, then, too, with altered states with plasma, you know, some sort of plasma connection. If they can, you know, somebody smoke DMT and then interact with plasma or somebody meditate or whatever the case may be because... There have been people that have speculated, too, that this is some byproduct of that, some sort of like um, consciousness related thing where maybe the things are being projected. And, you know, you've got great remote viewers of all, you know, like Ingo Swan and and all those people. So um, I would like to see something with that, too, because if what you're saying, that would be a good experiment to see, you know, that you're saying that there's something to this plasma, that it's not just a natural phenomena, that there's more to it than, you know, to create an experiment where somebody's interacting with it and seeing if it... Right. Know. Well, why, for example, if, even if the, if the... Let's assume that some of what I'm saying relates to UFOs and UFO experiences, that it is plasma. Why would people report seeing the same kind of creatures then? If it's a plasma, when each person sees something on their own, why would there be a consistency? Why would people have similar experiences through time? Why would people have religious experiences? Why would it seem to convert them? You know, almost everybody that has these deep experiences comes away in a polar opposite. Either it freaks them out and they believe that something bad is going on, or they're like Betty Andreas and they believe it's a message from God. Mm. Uh, and I remember I, the same time I talked to um, at the same the same place where I got to meet Jacques Vallée and I spent hours with him, I got to meet Betty Andreas and then talked to her for quite a bit of time. Uh, and Betty is convinced that hers is literally a message from God and angels, that that is what she interacted mm-hmm. with. Uh, and you go back in time, go back way back to the biblical time, uh, they were angels they spoke to. These were angels, mm-hmm. and they, were, they had some sort of a religious spiritual <coughs> message. 
before that they were the gods. Why is it consistent that way? Right. Why? Why? And so it's because there's something else going on. So the plasma that I'm that I'm talking about may be like the tip of an iceberg and something enormous that we really can't see is beneath the surface sure. that is producing the experiences. And I again, I hate I'm focusing on one little piece of the giant puzzle, and I don't want to go away with people saying, well, that's the plasma guy. He says it's all plasma because I don't believe it's all plasma. I just think it's one piece of this puzzle. And the plasma explains why I'm not excited with the Tic Tac thing to the extent where I believe, oh, they have seen that these are flying saucers from outer space. Right. Uh, I'm not convinced those are flying saucers from outer space. I think it's more likely mm -hmm. that this is the Office of Naval Research doing a wonder what if experiment. Mm. That yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you do look, like we said before, I mean I don't I don't know enough about this plasma thing to be like, oh, for sure this is what it is. But based on what you're I saying, know. it does seem like it's it should be at least equated into um, the situation and then researched a little bit more or looked into a little bit more from other people that are uh, really getting their hands dirty on this stuff. So um, I think that, again, what you're saying makes sense. But part of me thinks, though, that there's obviously more, like you're saying also, too, that there, this is a big puzzle. There's more layers to yeah. this. And even if you figure this out, well, then there's going to be other weird things that we can't explain. And it's always this, like, perpe perpetual... Yep. We can't grasp it. It's just within our, you know, just without um, or just uh, uh, beyond our reach. And, um, yeah, I think that's why people love this topic, too, because there is so many layers. And when you think you found something out, then you realize, oh, you might be wrong. And then something else pops up and it's just this whack-a-mole of what's going on. Well, we love a good mystery. Yeah. We know Whack-a-mole. I love it. It is whack-a-mole. <laughs> as soon as you hit one part of it, that, that's the it. Chuck You're cheese. right. Yeah. It is a, it is a whack-a-mole. And the, what it implies is that there's some, you know, even when you do the whack-a-mole thing, what we forget is there's something under it. It's not just that it, it's like something's popping up in reality over and over in different areas, but there's something under it all. And the assumption is there's some underlying connection there. Mm. Uh, all things are connected. That's it. I, or that all, we're all part of a web. Uh, the, the beautiful example I, I love to use is a quote from Chief Seattle. Although they say that the Seattle's words that have changed. And what he says is that we're all people of the web. And what he's saying is it's like a spider's web mm -hmm. that if you if you touch a part of a spider's web and you vibrate one part, it all vibrates. Everything connects to everything else. So you, if you're dealing with one little piece of a spider's web, you don't realize that it's somewhere else, too. This is Andrew's part. Andrew thinks that it's that there's some sort of interdimensional thing at work here. I just don't have to invoke that mm -hmm. in this, in this, in the part that I'm looking at. I don't invoke the interdimensional because then it gets really weird. The web right now, the I'm web sure. things is it, the web thing is an Eastern idea too. the web of Indra yes. from, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Hinduism and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, the Vedas, uh, when you look at, this phenomenon though and, and do you think that this hap it happens for a reason meaning that like you look at our psychology do you think that we're playing this game this big trick on ourselves or do you think that this is pushing us along to some sort of or for some sort of reason that we are just unaware of at this point well i don't think it's a trick uh there is a trickster but uh, even Carl Jung said that the the trickster is a way for us to explain our own stupidity from time to time, our own miscalculations and mistakes and so on. But uh, no, I don't think it's tricking us. Uh, I just think that it's it's like the air around us. It's just here. It's part of the natural order that li we live within. Uh, the Hopis talked about a world that is just part of the world in balance that if we're in touch with it we're in balance with it and we're harmonizing with it uh when we are out of touch with it and when we're out of balance things get really weird mm -hmm. and the strangeness and the bad stuff starts popping up all over the place to the the native american idea and it, it's about harmony 
and balance. Um, but, you know, we destroy things. We see everything as a resource to be used. Uh, they didn't. Uh, the the old people, the old the old ones, uh, they didn't own land because you can't own it. It's it's part of the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. You simply occupy it and utilize it as much as you need to, but you respect it. They didn't kill things just for the sake of killing them. They didn't overkill things. They only got what they needed and they had to have, and they held everything in reverence, and we don't. So. I see it as the world is sort of spinning out of balance. We're doing it to ourselves. There probably are too many people in the world. Um, I don't know that we can sustain our population. Um, and maybe it was meant to be. Maybe, you know, we were reproduction machines. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's one of the big drives that we have, just like um, – Viruses are reproduction machines. They're simply doing what they do. Same thing with bacteria. Hmm. Uh, but when you reproduce too much, you kill your host. Uh, that's the flaw with, you know, sooner or later, uh, a lot of viruses evolve to a point where they just exist and they don't kill the host. We have had viruses that do that. One of them is the herpes virus. Mm. The herpes virus doesn't kill you. It just gets to a point to where it can live and it can reproduce itself. Uh, but it doesn't kill off the host. Coronavirus kills off the host eventually. Right. Uh, or not everybody. Right, but right, right. So that's the flaw in its design. And eventually it will evolve to the point to where it can just simply exist, where it doesn't kill off the host. Hmm. So we, we do the same thing. Um, we are evolving uh, and multiplying to the extent to where we are using all the resources. Um that's why somebody like Elon Musk wants us to, you know, start colonizing Mars. Mm -hmm. Let's terraform it and, and colonize it. It's interesting. Uh, I won't we'll be around to see that it. Place. Well, yeah, maybe we already did. Yeah, you know, that's, that's one the of the theories, thing. right? There's yeah. a lot of UFO Who people knows? that, I, I, yeah, right. That, I don't know. Um. So, yeah, but no. that balance thing makes a lot of sense because, like, World War II, uh, well, according to a lot of people, that's when a lot of this stuff was popping up, you know, with, with the nuclear bombs and stuff, so that kind of stays in line with the balance thing. Obviously, the world was very out of balance at that point. And well, that's what, that was Carl Jung's book. He really talked a lot about that. At the end of World War II, people started realizing that we could destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons. That was Jung thing, Jung's thing. And that when we look to the skies, we look for salvation. And we projected an archetype, the mandala archetype. This, uh, this is pure young. We, we projected this archetype on objects that were seen in the sky. And this archetype symbolized wholeness and salvation. That is the mandala. Mandala is a disc. And that was Jung's primary idea, that people saw salvation in the sky. That's what most of the contactees said. The contactees, this large group of 40 or 50 people starting in the in the late 40s, but went through the 50s and 60s, said that a spaceship landed in front of them. And generally some Nordics walked out and told them they were here because Earthlings were going to destroy themselves and that we needed to take care of the planet and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's what Jung said all that was about, that we were looking for salvation from the sky, salvation from extraterrestrials. So I don't know if all that's true or not. Yeah. I like Jung's ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that don't we? We all want to be say, you know, the, the idea that we're this is one and done, and you're here and you live and then you die and that's it. You know, you cease to exist. Um, I, I think that most people want to believe that there's more, whether it's a sky daddy or aliens or. Uh, something with higher knowledge, right? Because I think that's what most people even think within the UFO, that somebody knows something. But in my personal opinion from talking, you know, doing all these interviews and research, and I feel like maybe they don't know as much as they, that's, you know, like this idea that there's this, you know, the private sectors, they have all the answers or whatever. I don't think that that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think that maybe they have better data or they do more experiments. Like you were mentioning, they just try different things and uh, see if there's anything to it kind of a thing. But this, this idea that there is this 
empirical knowledge that life for sure exists or this. I, I don't know yeah. that we know that, in my opinion, from what I've do seen. You, do you believe in an afterlife? I'm, I'm real curious. Do you believe or you just don't know? You um, think it might be, it might not. I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic schools, and then around 13, 14, 15, I started to ponder ideas like panspermia and aliens and uh, all sorts of stuff. I, I believe that based on the experiences I've had, meditating, psychedelics, I feel like consciousness is not, um, is not specific to the body, meaning that we can either Correct. project it or... Um, there's something to it that, that suggests that maybe there is another level. You know, there's this old book, uh, my uncle told me to read, which it's called, uh, I think it's called Flatland or Flatlands. I, I have it on my Kindle by, um, uh, is it Edward Abbott or I forget the guy's name, but right. it's an older book, but it just talks about like dimensions and like the different planes and like, you know, we see everything in, in three dimensions. And if you want to count time as the fourth dimension, uh, but there could be infinite dimensions or there could be, you know, string theory calls for 11 dimensions. You know, there's all these different um, theories out there. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at just the simplicity of it, that um, the only thing we know is, is that we're born and then we die. But mm -hmm. if that's all you're given, then to say that you don't know what happened or we know for sure that when you die, that's it. You know, the brain turns off that idea is wholly predicated on the idea that consciousness is a byproduct of, uh, you, you know, yeah. your brain is a, is a physical uh, right. mechanism. So if that's the case, it, you know, that whole theory predicates on that idea. So if they find out that consciousness is not a hundred percent tied directly to the brain, then I think you'll have uh, people believing that maybe there's a little bit more out there. However, for me personally, I believe that there's more. I don't know what it is. Right. I don't believe that there's. We're going to go up to some pillowy, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, pillowy, uh, uh, you know, beautiful, shimmering, you know, cloud city, you know, type of a thing. But um, again, maybe that there's different levels, or maybe. Our energy gets recycled. There's a lot of evidence for reincarnation as well. So what does that okay. mean? You know. So I, I guess what I think is is I'm open, but I'm open to the idea that if one of or two of these things exist, I think they can all coexist together. That maybe while you have the UFO thing is all these different pieces of a puzzle, it could be the same thing for consciousness or like our existence or our purpose or whatever in the sense that you know, this is just part of the puzzle or maybe just the beginning, or maybe we're, yeah. we're, we're infant souls at this point. And, uh, you know, this was the, the, the jumping off point for what's to come or something okay. like that. Maurice, do you believe in something after? Yes, I do. That's it's it. That simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I agree with a lot of the same stuff Michael was talking about, but I, I do think that the uh, the consciousness goes past this physical realm. Now, what that means, I, I don't know. That's kind of what this podcast has been predicated on, is trying to figure out what's what's out there. But maybe we'll never know. Maybe our brains aren't even able to, to handle that. But I think there's more to it. Um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Okay. There was just a... Paper. What about you? Well, hold on. Before he, before he says that, before we ask, I, I, there was just a paper released talking about how one person's consciousness can have, can uh, affect, I forget exactly, it had more to do with a specific thing, and I'd have to look it up after this. It was I just saw it yesterday. Um, they did an experiment, and one person's consciousness was able to affect another person's consciousness remotely. They don't, I don't, again, I didn't, oh, yeah. I don't remember the specifics of it. I'd have to go back and look. But um, so when you look at that as, as, if science is looking into these things and finding connections now, I think that uh, they're going to be on track with what a lot of us have been talking about for a while now. So, Persinger did a lot of research in that and consciousness, one person affecting another. Actually, in different labs, he was working with other labs, so a person would go into a copper-shielded Faraday cage, acoustically sealed uh, in in Canada, and then somebody would go in one, say, in Florida, 
And then they would do one thing to one of the people and it would happen to the other one. Hmm. That's all that's written up. If you look up Michael Persinger, uh, you can actually find a list of his studies and then links to almost every one of them. All of them are published in peer reviewed journal. Persinger actually uh, referenced my work in this several times in his back. And I was very pleased with that. Uh, but Persinger actually started the tectonic strain theory. Mm. Uh, Persinger did not believe that any of this had a consciousness, that it was just plasmas, that it was just uh, ball lightning or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and that it's just basic neurological processes being affected by electromagnetic fields, um, which are what comes out of plasmas. So anyway, so there you say um, though we're, I'm, we're living, breathing magic. We're having this conversation through a thing, a device, exactly. technology that somebody created. That if we were to get wiped out, would they even know what where to begin with recreating no. that? So Absolutely you know, you not. look at like the ancient civilization aspect of things, and then you look at, um, I just it's it's tough it's tough to realize that we are literally stardust that has evolved into these creatures that manipulate and can even navigate magic. the universe so when yep, you think this stuff's when, magic to me when you think about yeah. it like that it's like it's hard to just say oh well this is what it is and this is who we are and we just yeah. gotta make the best of it you know um and i think that's depressing um in in a certain way right i mean you're a psychologist it's depressing in the sense that if you believe that this is all there is the people that i talk to that like hardcore materialists or yeah. uh, reductionists or just people that you know only think in terms of uh this and then that's it and they're very they have a very like depressing take on it and then the ones that see themselves as optimistic oh i'm an optimistic atheist and this is just our yeah. calling and we just have to be the best people that we can you look at like plato and socrates and socrates was even saying that this idea that natural physics you know when the the ionian physicists came into the picture that it's mm -hmm. dangerous because you're taking almost like ethics and morality out of the picture without say you know by saying that there's nothing more to life than just this physical world um so i don't know so what, do you think that there's there's more to life, like an afterlife, or w what's your thoughts on that? Well, I've gone, I have gone back and forth many times. I had one of my most depressing times was when I was being, actually it was when I was working for the office and they were researching this project and a graduate student in psychology. Uh, I had come to believe, when I, when I thoroughly believed that when you're dead, you're dead, and that everything is biological, everything is neurological, everything boils down to chemical, biochemical reactions in the brain. I had a series of dreams that were horribly depressing, and I came out of them realizing that that belief was wrong, mm. which was strange. Uh, so I hit this low point, believing everything is physical, which is pretty much what, you know, that, that is kind of what you're taught. Uh, when you go into sciences, particularly biology and biochemistry and neurology, that it all ends at, at death. So there was a time when I believed that. Then I got interested in things like Edgar Casey, which we've talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, Native American stuff, UFOs, everything else. And the universe got bigger than this physical science would lead you to believe that it is. Uh, the universe is big. It has all kinds of possibilities. I know that some consciousness can survive. I don't know that everybody's does. Mm. <laughs> I know that I, I believe that everything is made from the same stuff, whatever that primordial substance is. Um, I don't believe in the afterlife of heaven and hell. Um, I just say that point blank. Um, but because of the work that I do uh, in psychology, I believe that we do have consequences to how we live our lives. Um, I think there are long-term consequences. I don't know. I believe some people have some consciousnesses have been reincarnated. I don't know that everybody's is. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really know what happens. Um, that's, that's kind of what I believe. I think there is good evidence that some people appear to have reincarnated. 
and some some consciousness appears to extend beyond physical life. Hmm. Be, and I know that it's a very weird universe. We live, we are like antennas moving through this electromagnetic energy field. And I, I use that term uh, on purpose. Carl Jung called it, he, he called it um, a psychic spectrum that electro, the electromagnetic energy uh, spectrum is a psychic spectrum that we exist in. That was in his UFO book too, his book on flying saucers, mm -hmm. which is the same thing that John Keel said. And the same thing the Native American said. So I'm not really answering. I'm saying, I don't know what I believe. I have all possibilities open. But I do believe that there are some people, there's very good evidence that some people have in fact reincarnated. And very good evidence that some consciousness in some circumstances has continued on. And that consciousness can in fact communicate over vast distances instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that tells me there's something else that we're not seeing. It is a massive puzzle. That puzzle is a lot. It's probably covering the entire earth. And you can get trapped looking at any area. So some famous accounts yeah. are like uh, Dorothy Eady, um, the woman who uh, felt she was a reincarnation of a um, pre-dynastic uh. Egyptian um, uh order or something along those lines she thought she was you know somehow connected to um that and then you know I, though the story's weird you have to go check it out but she actually helped yeah. a lot of egyptologists find temples and archaeological sites mm. that she would have had okay no way of knowing where these things were because right. this is just based on her believing she lived this previous life and uh, it's actually really fascinating it's one of the more believable ones in my opinion and it's interesting because right. it has to do with ancient egypt um, who were pretty much, you know, who knows? They might know. They uh, might have known a lot more no, we than we know, know in terms of death and that kind of stuff. Um, right. But in terms of uh, uh, that, so you have Dorothy Eady. You have that little kid who was having dreams right. uh, that he was a pilot in the South Pacific during uh, World War II and could remember the plane. And then they went and found out that right. this was an actual guy in a real plane that went down and all sorts of stuff. So that's a famous one. There's a famous Indian girl um story where she was reincarnated like a couple villages over and then she went and met with the, the family uh, so there's a lot of those that you can look up that you know do have credibility to them and people have verified that this is real based on families meeting this new soul mm -hmm. supposedly but it's really this reincarnated soul um so there's that but i think last time you were on maybe it was last maybe it was the first time i don't know i talked to you about the psychology of thinking about these things in terms of um i feel like i'm always learning something new and when i learn something new it kind of detracts from other things that i was excited about you know what i'm saying <laughs> and then yeah, so, so know, you're doing this dance where it's like Back i want I, I want to believe but then there's evidence to debunk that but then it's it is that whack-a-mole effect but then um you know, that correlates into what we're talking about, like life and death. Do you believe that there's more to life? Do you believe that something happens when we die kind of a thing? And I think if you're being true to yourself, you do have to do the seesaw thing. However, there is something about believing that I can't really put my, my finger on, that when I, when I have believed in things, there's some synergistic effect that happens within life where things get rolling and things are good and you know you feel good and maybe that's just the yeah. idea that you're taking some of the load off your own shoulders kind of a thing uh maybe it's i don't even know but there's something about it that feels better so when i was talking about like materialist and reductionist um being kind of uh depressing to, to listen to and talk about these mm -hmm. things um that's kind of where i'm going with it where it's almost like it's better even if it doesn't exist it might be better to believe in something greater in the sense that it just gives you it gives you that 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 purpose or the you know the telos or something along those lines a better life it gives you a better life yeah. more enjoyable life well if you I, I think one of the quotes that i used before was uh from uh really from john keel the mothman prophecies talked about it slightly the movie and in his book but it is this um if you notice it, if you notice this other side, it notices you. Hmm. You noticed it, 
and it noticed you. And mm. I think that works in many different ways. And Jung talked about synchronicity, that synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence. Well, what causes it? Well, it's getting in touch with something and synchronicity starts happening, which means you start noticing things you normally wouldn't notice. That's mm. really what synchronicity is about because coincidences happen every second of your life. <laughs> a coincidence right, right, right. is one event and another happens. They right. happen every second of your life. Meaningful coincidences, which is synchronicity, means you notice these two seemingly unrelated events and that they have some sort of meaning to you. Right. So I think that that noticing this other side of life or this other purpose, noticing this giant puzzle gives us meaning and it begins to make us aware of all the coincidences out there in this universe. And that in and of itself gives us a lot of meaning. It makes our lives more interesting and it makes it probably, it makes everything more important to us. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of people that don't believe in anything, all skeptics, mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty miserable people. There's not much in life that has any meaning. Nothing has any lasting meaning. If you believe that when you're dead, you're dead, there is no such thing as lasting meaning. Right. Because even if you say, well, I'm going to do this for my kids, well, they're going to be dead. And their kids are going to be dead. Ultimately, it has no long term. Whatever you do is going to have no long term effect. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the effect of you is totally gone. That makes everything meaningless. So. Uh, I just think that noticing all this stuff, being involved in it, believing that there is something deeper than just what we can see, I think it gives us meaning. Uh, but I think the meaning's really there. I think there is something really there, and we need to notice it. Mm. And if you notice it and you start paying attention to it, it pays attention to you. The risk is if you get trapped looking at one little area. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of in a rut myself right now. Not it's not even a rut. It's um so starting this podcast, we started out with the very most mystical and paranormal and fringe explanations for things, and that's where we started running. And through the process I I, I realized that there is this real fringe, but it's a lot smaller of, or a lot more narrow of a an area um than I previously thought. And then within like I want to know what, you know, the mainstream or the academics or, you know, the, the other people that are yeah. detractors think. I want to know how they think and why they think what they think. So I've gone down that path now where I want to know the psychology, the um, the philosophy, the the, the hardcore um, science behind these things. And through that process, it's it's hardened me a little bit in that regard. Um, however, as I mentioned, I noticed that through these ups and downs and in, in hills and valleys that when you're up on top of that hill, it feels amazing. So the, the goal would be maybe to keep finding these little niches and little things that, that get you there. Um, however, looking back at some of the things that I kind of considered BS when I first started learning about all this like materialistic uh, science and academic stuff that. I'm starting to realize that even that is just, you know, a fart blown in the wind in terms of, you know, you look yeah. at Thomas Kuhn's, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, philosophy of science and uh, paradigm shifts and scientific revolutions. And we might have talked about this before, too, but that's an ever changing picture as well. So it's almost like science in a way is this other thing that you believe in that has a better explanation for your physical surroundings However, it doesn't explain where we came from, why we're here, no. if there is even a why, and, our, and wh where we're going. And where we're going, you yeah. know. So yeah, teleology, ontology, and epistemology. Um, so and even scientists are guilty of misusing hypothesis and theory. We we I throw the theory around way too much, and we should try and say hypothesis when we say, when it's meant to be, and then theory yeah. when it's meant to be, but even string theory, you can't really test it, so is it really a theory? No. You know what I'm saying? So it's like stuff like yeah. that, where um, this old paradigm, now I'm starting to realize that um, I'm gonna, I'm, a tr I'm trying to get back to the believer status, and it's not, not that I don't believe, it's that I'm a little more skeptical than I was going into this thing. 
Well, you need to. Uh, well, I'm not going to prescribe that, but or prescribe something to you. But go ahead, um, prescribe it. No, no, doctor. It's, it experiences. <laughs> no, no, it experiences. Mm -hmm. um, it seems every time that I have gotten uh, hit a low point, uh, I have had some sort of experience. It's generally spontaneous. I don't bring it on. It's not by popping a pill or smoking something or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's spontaneous. Uh, and some of them have been just incredibly profound and just changed everything. I mean, it's like from one day to the next, totally different. It just changes. It's like really you make a 180, go the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you, you seek out an experience. I mean, that Native Americans did that, the vision quest, uh, different things that they did. They sought an experience, and the experience connected them to the whole. One of the things that I wanted to mention here when you were talking about reductionism and science and all that, and I've, I've wrote a, um, a letter to a local newspaper here in Memphis because people were talking about science, the coronavirus thing and science. Yeah. Okay. And that we're all sci we're driven by science. We're going to be driven by data and science as if, and they're talking about science like it is the Catholic Church speaking in old times. Well, the church says this. Or God says this, or our religion says this, because science isn't really who's speaking to us. It is somebody who calls themselves a scientist who is looking at numbers or data and then giving their interpretation. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're giving us the exact weight of an object or the speed of sound or telling us the distance to the sun or distance to the moon. It's not that kind of science. It's somebody giving us an opinion based upon their observations. And that's what we're doing. We're giving opinions based upon our observations. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you start saying, oh, well, this is science, you're acting like science is totally factual that is giving you ultimate truth. But it's not necessarily doing that. They're simply giving opinions. The person that says there is no life after death is not telling you anything factual. They're saying that in their opinion, there's no data that indicates it. Right. But there's no data that says it's not true either. It's well, just they can't find the data. They say there's that things we can't measure. Is right. They would say it's anecdotal or subjective. But that's better than what they put. Well, right, forward. but I, I'm saying okay. So, for <laughs> instance, I'm on some like near-death experience forums and stuff. I find that topic very interesting. Yeah. A lot of the detractors in there will say, "Oh, it, it's anecdotal or it's person," you know. But then you you know you, so what? you do have people though trying to bring that. So, like we've had Dr. Penny Sartori on, and she's tried to conduct experiments where there's targets. So when somebody goes into whether they're cardiac arrest or death or whatever. And they get brought back to life. Did you, you know, were these targets that, you know, that kind of a thing? Could you acknowledge these targets? And I don't think she's had the kind of success that she was looking for. But that's the kind of thinking in science that if you're going to debunk something, you should try that way before you just say, oh, this is nonsense. Because you're not really doing anybody a service. You're actually holding us back. Like when scientists said in the 50s and 60s, all these um, psychoactive compounds had no medicinal or positive right. effect when we're finding out now that they might have the they best do. effect. You know, right. I think right. MAPS just came out with a thing. They've had 90% success with PTSD and MDMA. It's like, okay, yeah. well, why are these things, you know, so it's it's that kind of thinking that, that, that holds us back from uh, what's going on. And I do think that there are great scientists out there. I'm not trying to just shit on all scientists. I think there are credible scientists. There's a lot of cool scientists out there that we've had on this podcast doing cool things, cool experiments. But it's that idea that we, like you, what you're saying, that it's the end all be all. We must listen to them. They have all the answers, um, you know, and that's that's it. They have opinions. Right. Their opinions are based upon numbers that they've somehow seen or calculated, but they're still predictions, and, and it's just not. I mean, I'm a scientist. I've published <laughs> over 100 articles in scientific journals, but I'm aware that the, that's why you do statistics. They are simply ranges of possibilities, right. and those ranges aren't loots. They're always just possibilities. Right. 
So, and then you have I, even I'm not you have infighting, right? Because you're a, a psychologist. So then there's the hard scientists that say, "Oh, those are just the humanities," or "Oh, those are you know the non-hard sciences." But then it's like even within the hard science, stuff that's even empirical now will be replaced or updated in the future. So, oh, absolutely. So it, it's it's just this like, what do we believe? And I think science we should f- follow science because it's gotten us to this point technologically. Uh, or it's gotten to our civilization to this point. Uh, but when you start, it's it's the, the all-knowing thing or the ego or whatever the case may be. You know, it's this thing that gets in the way yeah. that says, I have all the answers, follow this. I, you know, this is how it is. Yeah. Right. Well, man, we've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> yeah. We can wrap it up here, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to. I don't mean to rain on anybody with this thing about it's the, this stuff about the tic tacs. My opinion, based upon a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you can look it up. There's actually been some articles about it. Uh, I'm not generating any of this out of my own head. It's all coming from research that's been done. It's it's easily verifiable. Uh, it's just what I believe probably is going on. And so I'm not trying to get, see, here. here's what I've done with the Tic Tacs in my own head. I know there's something real to the UFO phenomenon. I believe that the Tic Tacs would be a part of my huge puzzle that I'm looking at that'll get me off track. I'll say, oh my God, there's something physically real here. Mm-hmm. It's from worlds or it's alien when all the evidence to me shows that that's not it's part of this haystack of needles i'm looking for a needle and a haystack of needles it's one needle but this one is one that i believe is produced by the government Mm. based upon a needle the government found a long time ago long story but anyway uh it's a big puzzle that's just one piece of it yeah and I mean, you mentioned it. It's not that you don't believe and it's not that that's just what you think is going on. And I think that anybody listening to this that is objective um, should definitely take what you're saying into consideration when thinking about these topics. Because, again, aren't we all after truth? You know, are we are not after some sort of um, some answers here that we can hang our hat on? And um, I think that you're just speaking your truth and there's that's why we have this, that's why we have the show so people you know it doesn't matter that you know there's differences there are differences of opinion or people um, have different takes on a, on a topic that's why we're doing this let's put all the information out there and let people decide let people talk about it maybe there's something that comes out of it where we find out from both of the spectrum so it's like if you believe it's this and this person believes that maybe there's some something in the middle that that you know, or some place we can meet in the middle where there's the answer, yeah. something along those lines. So, exactly. Well, thank you again for coming on. Again, you are one of our favorite people to talk to. You're a wealth of knowledge, <laughs> and uh, you you know you cover a lot of different topics, and you understand the mind, which I think is important when discussing these topics. Um, so definitely go check out his book. I have a link down below. Uh, Denisovan Origins. I think I said Denisovan again earlier in the episode. No, you did Denisovan. it right. Denisovan. Um, you We're nailed there. it. We're uh, getting there. Yeah. Uh, Denise of an <laughs> Origins, and the link's down below. Also, fr- freedomtochange.org uh, is his website. And do, do you have a name for your new book that's coming out? Uh, right now, the tentative name, it'll be put up by Inner Traditions. We're working on a deadline. It's called Origin of the Gods. That is Andrew's thing. And the whole idea is where did our whole idea of the gods come from and these powers that be? That's what it is. We're searching for the origin of the gods. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm talking so much about Native Americans. It's also why UFOs fit into it. Yeah. Beautiful. Next time we have you on, that's what we'll talk about too, because I know that's your expertise. Right. And we haven't really focused on the ancient mounds yet, which we we did a little bit in the um, uh, Denise of an Origins episode, but we would like to get get deep on that. But uh, thank you again the for mounds com- are cool. Yeah, thank you again for coming on, and uh, we appreciate your time. Stay safe out there. Uh, we love everybody. You can check us out at. Uh, I updated our website and actually made a new website for us. It's mindescapepodcast dot com. Please subscribe to our channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please subscribe. Uh, our Patreon is patreon.com slash Mike and more, or I'm sorry, I updated that as well. Patreon.com slash mind escape podcast. And we actually have um, uh, something with uh, Dr. Gregory up on there as well. So you can listen to him talk about native ah. American metaphysics, which is a very interesting cool. topic. So yes, it is. All right, folks. Thank you again. And uh, you guys have a good day. Peace. Pleasure. Cheers.